And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. We're so glad to have you tonight. And um, as we have our, our last Wednesday night service before Christmas, and uh, actually be two weeks, uh, well, one, two, three weeks from tonight before we go back with you on Wednesday night. And then this Sunday we'll be live in person um, for our Sunday service. And then the following week we'll be virtual. And then followed by the following Sunday as a live service. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. As we continue in our ongoing series on soteriology, the study of salvation. Hallelujah. Last week we were talking about um, justification. And uh, the week before that we were talking about, um, as we were talking about some of the benefits or the um, um, aspects of uh, the so forth. I'm trying to get back to where we were because we, this is a few weeks ago. Um, last week we began justification and, and then this week we're talking about um, regeneration. And we talked about how they, were, they, they did go hand in hand. Uh, and so we will jump right in here. Regeneration. Uh, we need to understand the words of Jesus to Nicodemus. When he looked at him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. Glory to God. And um, now, the, the church, church, traditionally in the church world, they've, they kind of misconstrue uh, this and, and they kind of come up with different meanings for it. Um, you know, the weren't term born again. We had, you know, now, now you got born again marriages, born again businesses, born again this, all um, having nothing to do with the religious uh, or the Christian connotation of the words of Jesus. And so we do want to um, make sure we understand the true meaning. The word that's translated again, born again, born again, um, means literally born from above. Born from above. And so we must be born from above. And, um, and so, you know, there's um, a, oh gosh, I'm trying to find, um, the words are baiting me right now. Um, being born from heaven, being born of God, not just, you know, born again. Remember Nicodemus said, how can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, you know, uh, you a master or a teacher of Israel and don't understand these things. Um, so let's talk about, um, we talk about, we call this the new birth, born again, born from above. What does it mean? Now let's kind of look at this, uh, you know, in, in talking about what it does mean, um, it also helps us to understand what it does not mean. So understanding what it does not mean can also give us insight into what it does mean. First of all, the, the new birth it is um, not reformation. You are not reformed. You are not. Um, you are not um, turning or amending your ways or you know becoming a better person. It's not reformation. Reformation is human origin. It is an outward only in its effect. It does not change the inner man. You know, simply saying, well, you know, some people say, well, you got religion. You went to church and you got religion. Well, you know, if you didn't get born again, uh, that's all you did get is you got religious practices. And it's not, it's not what this is. Um, if you took a watch into a watch uh, maker or repair shop, and um, now this, this, will, this will date it, but using this example, the mainspring, and some of y'all remember, used to wind up our watches. Now they're all digital. They're you know hooked up to the atomic clock and all this stuff. But um, used to uh, you would you would uh, wind the watch. We even had t phrases from preaching. You know that one was a stem winder. You know it would wind, wind it would wind your watch up right by itself. Um, but the main spring in there, once you got wound, it would help would do keeping time. But if that main spring is broke, you took it to the the. the uh, watch repair guy, and he took, put a new crystal on the outside of it, polished it up and cleaned it and all that stuff and handed it back to you. Okay. You reformed it, but you didn't fix it. You got the, you had to, you had to have a new spring put in there. It couldn't, the old one wouldn't work. Um, 
so that did not fix it. it you know, so reforming it didn't fix it. Hallelujah. Um, the heart is the trouble. In the watch scenario, that spring was the trouble. The heart of man is the trouble. And uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So that man needs something within that brings about a transformation from the inside. We, got to sing, that, we sing that song uh, in our circles. I got something on the inside working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. There must be a change on the outs inside that affects the outside and not vice versa. So it is not becoming religious. Um, you know, you average, you know, people who go to church all their life, well, they, you know, they, they grew up in the church and they, you know, they may pay tithes or they may pray. They may, you know, do good things, work at the, you know, work, work for the, um, uh, the homeless shelter in the church or whatever. But if you're not born again, all that, that's, that's just, those are good things. Those are admirable things. Those are great. Those are kind things. Um, but they, they don't mean you're born again. We got people who aren't even Christians who do those things. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that um, you're, you're a, you're a believer that you're born again. It just, you know, cause being, being religious does not affect change. Now, if you're born again, then it's going to, that's going to affect change in you, and these things will be things that you do. Um, I, I get that. If it was being religious was, um, was a qualification, Nicodemus was one of those people. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was part of the highest ecclesiastical um, court of the day. Um, and if anybody could just get into heaven based on being a good religious person, Nicodemus was one of them. But Jesus said, you must be born again. Um, it's not a change of heart. And, and, and within the context of the vernacular, uh, turn over a new leaf, um, you know, start a new life, become a better person. You know, I, I've had a change of heart. Um, and that just means that we've made a decision to do something different. Um, be, being born again is not simply deciding not to be a bad person anymore or deciding to be a good person. Okay. Why? Because there's nothing you can do to make you different in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. It is, listen, the new birth, not a change of heart in the sense that, well, I'm going I'm, I'm to be a different person. I'm going to live better. The new birth is the impartation of something that the sinner did not possess before. It is the impartation of the life of God into a man who was not in harmony with God. Glory to God. Um, 1 John 5, 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. The divine it is the impartation of the divine nature to the heart and life of the sinner, which makes him a new creature or literally a new creation. And it's brought to pass through a personal union with Jesus Christ. Um, Second Peter one, four says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Glory to God. Um, when you're born the first time you receive your parents nature and they are lost in sin when you're when when I mean you're lost in sin fallen by nature okay and regeneration no one ever dreamed of saying he that hath Buddha hath life because you don't okay you, it is you must be born again. There must be an impartation of something from outside into you that causes you to be transformed. So what is it? You know, it's not those things. It's not a change of heart. It's not being becoming religious. It's not. Um, reformation. It's not reformation. That word just went blank. What it is, number one, a birth. What's whosoever 
believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him that is begotten of him. First John uh, 5 and 1. And then John 3, 8 says this, or speaks along this lines, that the Christian is being born of the Spirit. As many as received him, to the, let's, look, let's look real quick to John 1, 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. We'll look at verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to him gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of man, or the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Hallelujah. So it is a birth. You are born of God. Secondly, it is a cleansing. Um, Titus 3, 5 says, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, suggesting that there is a cleansing of the soul from the defilement of the old life. Now, not, you know, it, it also cleanses the soul. It's cleansing you. you know, your, your mind needs to be renewed, but there's a cleansing that takes place in you. Third, there's a quickening or making alive. Uh, we are saved uh, not only by the washing of regeneration, but also by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3.5 talks about the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It is a creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, or literally, as we said, new, new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Verse 18 goes on and says this, and all things are of God. Hallelujah. So we're a new creation. Hallelujah. Um, and it is a resurrection. Um, the new birth is a resurrection. It is preceded by death. Believers have been crucified with Christ and have been raised together with him. Both of these truths become a spiritual reality through identification with Jesus Christ. In his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Let's look in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 7. Romans 6, starting in verse 2. God forbid, how shall we are dead that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we are, we've been planted together in the likeness of his uh, death. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Glory to God. So we're dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, and that we walk in, a, in this newness of life, or one translation says, in a whole new sphere all together. Glory to God. Amen. The symbolization and the ordinance of water baptism and talking about this, we are buried with him in, in death and we are raised again together in newness of life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, this is a result of the identification with Christ in his death, his burial, then his resurrection. Hallelujah. Can you say glory to God? Paul says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins in Ephesians 2 1. Hallelujah. And then when, in Ephesians 2 5 and 6, he says, Even when we, when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, real quick, the new birth is not reformation. It is not being religious. It is not just changing your ways. It is a birth by and of God. It is a cleansing. 
it is a quickening or making alive. Quickening is an old English word um, that in its day meant to make alive. Okay. Um, a, a creation or a new creation. And it is a resurrection. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Say, you can give a shout out there over all that. Hallelujah. So, the new birth. Jesus said, marvel not that I say to you in John 3, 7, ye must be born again or born from above. Hallelujah. Why must a man be born again? That's, now, that's a legitimate question, and it deserves you know, a straight answer. Number one, because Jesus said you had to. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said you must be. You can't see. The, you know, except the man be born again, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God. So in order to be you know, enter in, you got to what? Be born again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Regeneration is not a privilege. It is an absolute necessity to be in the kingdom of God. Praise God. It's not that God won't allow the unregenerate to see the kingdom of God. It's just an impossibility. Remember under the old covenant, we, when uh, Moses wanted to see him, he said, no man seeing my face and can live. And then in that, he would only let him see his hinder parts as he walked, walked by on the cliff. You have to be born again to enter into the God's kingdom. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Secondly, you must be born again because of the nature of man's first birth. The second birth becomes necessary. We were all born of sinful parents and thus are sinners. One of the unbreakable laws of nature is that like begets like. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, Psalm 51, 5. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. Remember Galatians 5, uh, 19 through 21, list, or a partial list, really, of the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Or uh, literally the Greek says it something like this. It says the works of the flesh are um, manifest and are Similar to these. In other words, this isn't an, a conclusive list of it. These are just some of the highlights. Okay? And, and other stuff like that. Um, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like of which I tell you and see and such like you know this is just kind of you know put you in the ballpark there's a bunch of other stuff out there that would fit in here all right um, of the which I tell you before as I've told you in time past they that do such things uh, shall not inherit the kingdom of God and that really uh, we got some tent verb tenses in the Greek in some of these passages um, really it means it kind of carries more to convey in the, those that practice these things um, Romans 8, 7, and 9 says this, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And it goes on and says in verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. All right? Um, flesh is flesh, and it doesn't matter how you try to culture it or train it or develop it, it's flesh. Um, even how religious it becomes. That's why, you know, uh, we had we had the issues in the, in the church at Rome where they would do penance and these kind of things in order to achieve salvation. You cannot achieve salvation by works. And, I, you know, Martin Luther was crawling on that abbey on his knees, bleeding when the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, the just shall live by faith. Wrote his 99 Theses, nailed it to the door of the church, was considered a heretic, but started the, the Lutheran Reformation um, in, in Christianity, that, that we, are, we are saved by faith, grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. I cannot earn it. I can do 15 billion Hail Marys and still go to hell because it doesn't save me. I can do a thousand trillion our fathers and still go to hell. 
you must be born again. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, I got some hand claps going on out there. Um, so if you're not born again, you're not in the family of God. You can't claim God as your father. You can't join the company of believers. You have to be born into it. The flesh and spirit are two entirely different realms, and there is no way for a sinner by nature to make himself a child of God. The spiritual life which is necessary in order to become sons of God is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the work of regeneration, through faith in the redemptive work of Christ. Hallelujah. And I'm going to say something else. Another thing why you need to be born again. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to be happy in heaven even if you could get in there without it. Remember Peter sitting there on the boat one day, Jesus getting out there and gave the, the draw to fish. He turned and looked at Jesus and said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You see, without the new birth, you can't be in the presence of God. And you would not have any joy because you would be constantly reminded of your lack of standing and position with God. The natural man is dead in his trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians 2 and 1. He is completely devoid of spiritual life altogether. And the only way in which he may receive his, his, um, his, that life is the birth, rebirth of his human spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Arthur Pink says, let us realize that the sinner is not ignorant, needing instruction. He is not weak and in need of invigoration. He is not sick and in need, and in need of doctrine. He is dead and needs to be made alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You who were dead in your trespasses, passes, and sins, hath he quickened together. Hallelujah. Even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, he quickened us and made us alive. You were born again. Hallelujah. The unregenerate, according to Ephesians 14, is alienated. From the life of God. To be carnally minded is death. Romans 8, 6. Um, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 1 Timothy 5, 6. The difference between one who is a Christian and one who is not. The answer is just one word. Life. The life of God. One has spiritual life while the other is obviously absolutely dead. When Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He was stating a theological dogma, not laying down a divine edict. He was simply stating fact. He cannot see, let alone enter into the kingdom of God. He must be born
testing. Testing, 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 testing. Glory, glory, glory. Test, 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 test. You getting any better? Huh? Testing one, two, three, four. Okay. Just give her a shot. Um. So how the, how the new birth is received, no through no human effort. We can't earn it. It's by grace through faith. Um, it is important we realize that there is our, our, our certain means and agencies involved in our experience of being born again. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the agent. That is why he is referred, we refer to as the renewing of the Holy Ghost in Titus 3.5. Jesus in John 3.5-8 refers to being born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming into our heart of the believer brings the life of God, thus enabling us to be a partaker of the divine nature. The Word of God has a role. Indeed, the Holy Spirit bears witness to the Word to bring in the new birth to pass. Of His own will beget He us with the Word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. James 1.18 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, 23. The first creation was brought about by the operation of the word of God and the spirit. And God said, let there be. And the spirit of God moved, Genesis 1. Likewise, the creation of new creatures in Christ are brought about and brought to pass by the word and the spirit. It is a divine mystery. The actual new birth is, is clothed, clothed, clothed or clouded in mystery. We don't quite understand how it happens, but the Bible says it happens. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, amen. You know, uh, when Nicodemus was confused by it, he said that, you know, uh, Jesus said the wind blows where it lists, listeth. You hear the sound of it. You can't tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. So while we say that there is nothing man can do to regenerate himself, there is something we must do to obtain the regenera regenerating work of God in our own life. Hallelujah. We have to believe the message of the gospel. The sinner must believe the word of God. Remember the Bible says in Hebrews um, eleven six, they that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. The sinner must believe the work of Christ on the cross is sufficient for salvation. There must uh, ever be a close relationship between the doctrines of the cross and regeneration. Um, 1 Peter 1, 17-23 shows us that on the basis of the precious blood of Christ, in verse 19, one is born again, verse 23. And we must accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Salvation is immensely an intensely personal experience. There are no grandkids. There are no great nephews. You must be individually born again. A place in our faith in all that Jesus did and has done for us, we receive him as Savior. 
John 1 12 says but as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name in Galatians 3 26 says for ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ so what are the effects or the results of the new birth um when you get the privilege of being child, uh, called a child of God. You know, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 16 and 17. So it makes the believer a child of God. Second, it makes the believer a new creation. Hallelujah. And partaker of the divine nature. The whole attitude is transformed. He now loves the brethren. You know, um, they shall know we're Christians. You know, we had that song, we shall know that they shall know they are Christians by, their love, by our love. Amen. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, that ye have love one for another. Hallelujah. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, loveth, uh, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. 1 John 5, 1. We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He now loves God in a new and deeper way because we love him because he first loved us. 1 uh, John four nineteen. How to, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all day. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, uh, 2 and 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Hallelujah. He even has an inborn love for his enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And the new birth enables the believer to have life, a life of victory, over sin and the world and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness ephesians 4 23 and 24 if we know that he is righteous you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him first john 2 and 29 well whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin or practice sin for he is Seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin or practice sin, because he is born of God. First John three nine, Hallelujah. Um. He doesn't. You don't make it a habit, okay? Praise God. Next, adoption. Praise God. We, we're adopted. Adoption as a doctrine is a phase of our salvation, which is seldom stressed. Um, yet it is a great truth which every believer should realize and appropriate. The word adoption is used exclusively by Paul in his epistles. And he, write, he uses it five times. Once a term is applied to Israel as a nation, who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption. And uh, in another passage, Paul uses it to refer to the full culmination of our experience at the second coming of the Lord. Even we ourselves groan within. Hallelujah. Ourselves waiting for adoption to wit. The redemption of our bodies. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise be to God. And you know what? I, I just went blowing right by into the next stage. Past regeneration right into adoption. Hallelujah. Um, I wanted to. Yeah, we'll, we'll finish this. No, we won't. We won't. Um, yeah, we will. We'll finish right here. Okay. We will finish this up. All right. So we've gone through justification, regeneration. Now adoption. Praise the Lord. Um, the other three times that Paul uses this word is to present the fact of a life in Christ, of the Christian. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians 4, 4, and 5. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1, 15, or 5. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. It's important to realize that the manner in which Paul used the word adoption has virtually nothing in common with, with which the, the way we use it today in our society. 
In human custom, adoption is the means by which an outsider may become a member of the family. But this is not so in the family of God. The word adoption literally means placing as a son. Hallelujah. The believer, after becoming a child of God through the new birth, is immediately advanced to maturity of position, being constituted as an adult son by this legal practice placing of adoption. Now, you may be a child, spiritually child in your, your spiritual growth, but you have been established in the position of a full-grown son. Hallelujah. With all the rights and benefits that pertain thereof. Hallelujah. There is nothing, no childhood period, in the sphere of the Christian responsibility. God addresses the same appeal to holiness and service to every Christian, regardless of the length of time he may have been saved. Schaefer says it this way. Whatever God says to the old and established saint, he says to every believer, including those most recently regenerated. There should be no misunderstanding respecting the babe of Christ, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3.1, who is a babe because of carnality and not because of of immaturity in years in the Christian life. In human experience, legitimate birth and adoption never combine in the same person. There is no occasion for the father to adopt his own child. In the realm of a divine adoption, every child born of God is adopted at the moment he is born. He is placed before God as a mature, responsible son. Adoption does not mean son making, but son placing. Thus, the child is placed as a son. <coughs> the minor as an adult. These and states, in regeneration, we receive new life, in justification, a new standing, and in adoption, a new position. Hallelujah. Adoption takes place the moment we are born into the family of God. It is simultaneous with regeneration and justification. In the eternal counsels of God, it took place when we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. Uh, finish that up and um, we will pick up with some other things after the first of the year glory to God but we're so glad that we've had this time to talk about these things and share them with you and uh, trust that you've helped you know, you've enjoyed our study on the lines of soteriology and the study of salvation and uh, we'll we'll see what we dive into for the after the first of the year on our Wednesday night Bible study and um, we sure look listen if you can be with us on this Sunday we sure would love to see you before Christmas and like we said, uh, um, no more Wednesday night until the, the first Wednesday of January, um, which is the 6th. Thank you. Hallelujah. Which is the 6th of January. We do have ser uh, live service this Sunday and the following Sunday. Virtual service the Sunday after Christmas. Hallelujah. Well, we sure love you. God bless you. We want you to be blessed throughout the uh, upcoming uh, season where you, you know, have opportunity to minister to people and share the love of God with people. And um, until we meet again, I want you to remember these words of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here. Faith and victory.